this this is a, a study published some years ago, but it shows the dietary uh, contrast between eating a diet high in fruit and vegetables and whole grains, which is rich in phytochemicals, versus the typical Western diet, which is a lot of meat and dairy and fat and refined products and so on. And you can see the risk of type 2 diabetes for those that are in the highest quintile versus the lowest quintile, the Western diet, uh, almost 60% increased risk, whereas those on the prudent diet, substantially less. Um, the same sort of thing from Hong Kong, eating these refined uh, foods, dumplings, uh, flour, meat products, so forth, versus a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and soy and you can see that the higher consumption the fifth quintile is a 25 percent decrease in the fruit and vegetables whereas in the refined products meat rich diet it's an increase of 50 percent and just a couple more pictures quickly the intake of anthocyanins, which is reflected in eating a lot of berries, reds, blues, and purples, you have a 15% lower risk of diabetes. And also eating cruciferous, your leafy greens, you have a 32% reduction in the highest, in the Q5, the highest consumers of, of these things. And another experiment with sprouts of uh, broccoli, you see the insulin response or the insulin levels rather decrease as the level of isothiocyanate, namely sulforaphane in the sprouts increases. So you eat more, five grams, 10 grams of the, of the sprouts and it shows that the insulin is working more effectively because the levels are lower. So why do I show all this in respect to diabetes? I've done some research with, with Navajo population in the Southwest. And my observation is that these are, these are the greens that they harvested in springtime and summer. And these are mustards, these, these are akin to the cabbage family, amaranth, mustard, pigweed, peppergrass, purslane, etc. Um, these this was what the original Native American diet was. And what did they eat? In addition to that, they harvested the fruits and the berries off the bushes. Wolfberry and manzanita and the prickly pear, the tuna that we talked about last time. And these, these things are rich in phytochemicals, the very things that um, we see protect against diabetes um, in, in our dietary is, is found also in the Native American diet. And the question is, if only they had stuck with this diet instead of being drifting off to the Western or the SAD diet, the standard American diet, they wouldn't have such massive rates of obesity, of, of diabetes today, which are also connected with, with the obesity. So the point is that diabetes can be corrected by, by eating the phytochemical rich fruits and vegetables, whether you harvest them in the field in the wild or whether you cultivate them and eat them. So let's move now to the last of the three chronic diseases that we were um, mentioning and that is cancer. One of the original ones, this again is taken from the um, Kelsey Physic Garden in London. We mentioned in the first lecture, this picture in the garden there, in the Botanical Gardens, which was the Arthur Carey um, set up for early medicine. And here the, peri the Madagascar periwinkle contains 
these alkaloids that have immunosuppressive effect and are used for the treatment of leukemia and lymphoma because they, they are now reduced uh, synthetically. Looking in the literature, uh, this was probably done 10 or 12 years ago. I did a count, and these are the number of articles for these commonly consumed herbs and spices that are used in Western diets or diets around the world. And you can see garlic and turmeric particularly have a very large number of uh, articles in Medline. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know this was. So some of the herbs that will help protect against cancer, we've listed them here, the Allium genus, um, garlic, onion, chives, shallots. These are all rich in sulfur compounds of a variety. Um, angelic brew of like 20 or 30 different uh, sulfur compounds. Then we have the tubers that are pictured here, the uh, turmeric and ginger. Well, this is actually candy ginger. And then we have the herbs of the carrot or the or the parsley family and, and flaxseed here with its ability to help with breast cancer. And the next picture shows you these um, carrot or parsley family. Technically they're called Apiaceae herbs and they're pictured here, some of them, dill, cumin, cilantro, the seed is coriander but the leaf is cilantro very common in Spanish Puerto Rican dishes, and parsley. These all have unique phytochemicals, thalides, polyacetylenes, and coumarins. And these have anti-cancer activity. And then there are the mint herbs, the ones that are um, listed here, basil, oregano, sage, oops, sorry. Um, some mushrooms and ginseng, all of these have a variety of different phytochemicals. And here's the, the, the mint family, or technically it's called the Lamiaceae herbs. And these are different from the Apiaceae. Uh, these are rich in terpenoids. These are the sweet smelling, readily volatile. So you don't want to have these lying around for a long time. Uh, I recommend that if you have bottles of these that after six months you discard them because they've probably lost their potency. This just shows you an electron microscope picture of the calyx under the petals and the peppermint and shows you these, these two secretory glands where these terpenoids are located. And this is sage, again showing you these secretory glands. It's almost eerie looking at these heavily magnified structures. Very beautiful. So just looking at garlic, a number of human studies uh, have shown the odds ratio numbers given here for stomach cancer and colorectal cancer. Uh, quite potent in terms of gastrointestinal cancer protection. And this, this is either raw or cooked garlic. And the important thing that some people don't realize um, is that the application of heat is, is, is an important time factor. You see the chemistry over here, the natural compound in garlic is allene. And there's an enzyme called alanase, which converts this to allicin. And from allicin, you get this variety of sulfur compounds, sulfur oxides, disulfides, trisulfides, the whole basket full of them. Um, 60 seconds of microwave heating or 45 minutes of oven heating can inhibit garlic's work. So 
the reason this is that it, the heat will kill this enzyme. So what one needs to do is chop or crush the gut, the clove, because the, the, the physical action of cutting or crushing will activate the enzyme and cause this reaction to take place. And then if you let it sit or stand for 10 minutes um, before you apply the heat, then the allicin can form from the crushing and then it can generate these active phytochemicals. So these studies suggest that heat destroys garlic's ability to produce the compound. So if you want to get anti-cancer activity, then once you've cut the garlic, you need to let it sit for 10 minutes to get the full activity. Now, rosemary also anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antioxidant properties. It has a number of polyphenols, uh, canosic acid and rosmarinic acid, etc. These diterpenoids can interfere with cellular pathways that are involved with cell proliferation. And a number of studies in animals and cell cultures have shown that these compounds are in fact working in multiple uh, ways in different pathways and they can suppress the development of tumors in several organs, colon, breast, liver, stomach, as well as melanoma and leukemia cells. So sprinkle a little rosemary on your baked potatoes or however you want to use it and you'll get good protection. And then onions. Onions are not as powerful as garlic, but they have a flavonoid called quercetin. And quercetin pictured here has a number of effects and <clears throat> inhibits cell proliferation, inhibits tyrosine kinase and uh, nuclear factor kappa B activation. It um, protects DNA damage and induces apoptosis and arrests cell cycle in, in different phases. So a number of half a dozen pathways, and this is come somewhat characteristic of the phytochemicals in these products that we're talking about. They act in more than one more than one way. Now this is a, just a picture to show you the flavonoids in different varieties of onions. And the ones on the left here are the strong, uh, bitey, powerful ones that make you cry. Um, the ones down on the end here are the softer varieties, the, the dahlia onions from Georgia, probably the Walla Walla sweet onions are up this end too. So the intense flavor um, strong effect are um, rich in the flavonoids. Okay, so there's a move towards getting rid of bitter tasting broccoli and cabbage and onions and so forth, but it's a fact that the ones that are a little strong, a little bitter, are the ones that are the most potent in phytochemicals. Uh, this is the total antioxidant activity and you get the same sort of thing. Strong pungent onions are up the top and the mild onions down the bottom. Now, what does all this mean? Well, if you look at human cancer cell proliferation, you can see that the soft, the mild onions, they, they are protective, but it's fairly weak. You have to have very high levels, whereas the strong tasting ones in very low levels are inhibiting cell proliferation very strongly. And then uh, curcumin in turmeric is also known to suppress a number of um, cancers. So mixing up your your scrambled tofu with a bit of turmeric and some onion parsley will make a, a great hemopreventive dish. And again, coumarin acts. Well, I'm not going to read all these, but it acts in many different ways to. Uh, arrest cell cycle and interfere with cellular processes that have to do with cancer. 
Acumin also from turmeric um, reduces the side effects of chemo and radiotherapy, <clears throat> resulting in the improvement of the patient's quality of life. So that's something that can be shared. And then a couple of other herbs, Boswellia salata and greater celadine. Um, these are uh, available. You can see here the resin, which has anti-proliferative, anti-tumor activity, and is especially used for brain tumors. And then the greater celadine, which is was um, a semi-synthetic drug, was developed in Ukraine. And it's, today it's called Ukraine without the E. Um, it's a derivative of the alkaloid mixture from that. So just to remind ourselves the phytochemicals that are scattered all over these products, these plants that we've mentioned, can act as antioxidants. They can, they can inhibit oncogene expression, induce apoptosis, inhibit cell cycle progression, et cetera. They can block phase one enzymes that activate carcinogens and they can induce phase two enzymes like GST um, that enhance the getting rid of the carcinogens. So a whole range of things that are going on. And these are these are some of the uh, phytochemical families and where they are found and you can see they're not just grains and vegetables and fruits but spices and herbs are scattered all through this. Just to concentrate a little bit more, here are some of the things that we've talked about and the compounds, the phytochemicals that are found in them. And then lastly, in lecture number two, um, we were going to talk about those that impact the immune system. There are four that are mentioned here, astragalus, the garlic, of course, we know is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, turmeric, which has the ability to stimulate the activity of white blood cells. And then the one that probably most people know about is um, echinacea. There's three varieties, purpuri, angastifolia, or pallida. And the root is, is where they are most active. But again, be careful because adulterants can often be added, lookalikes can be put in this, and so the echinacea may be weakened uh, or not work at all. So these compounds are all, um, as we've mentioned here, AGE, astragalus, garlic, echinacea are used. These are all used for reducing colds and flus. And this is the, coming back to the garden again, shows you Echinacea purpurea being um, used for colds and flus. And ginseng, uh, full of the saponins that can also boost the immune system. Okay, I um, need to stop sharing and open my other PowerPoint for lecture number three. Um, I, I wanted to take a few minutes to, um, are we all seeing this? Really? Okay. I wanted to show a little bit of, because I think it's very important in the whole discussion of herbs to realize um, the importance of placebo. There's a lot of discussion about, will herbs just have a placebo effect? Well, the answer is, so what? If they don't cost much money and they don't uh, have any major harmful effect, maybe there's some value to use that. And it's very common in the medical profession. I, I have about eight or 10 pictures. I want to quickly run through this before we, we look at some other factors, but they are known to improve um, or cause remission of the chronic diseases we've talked about. And I just want to show you some of the 
experiments when a British research group tested a, a chemo drug for stomach cancer. They found that a third of the recipients that received a placebo lost their hair and 20% of them developed nausea and vomiting, which is what you would expect if they were actually getting the chemo. So when people get a fake pill uh, and they believe that they're getting an active drug, what I've underlined here is very key. Anticipation may shape the response of the body. And there's a, there's a mechanism being proposed for that. So patients who have pain, depression, anxiety, irritable bowel, so forth, given um, aspirin or vitamin pill or starch or given a saline injection or some other placebo can end up feeling better. And that's not uncommonly done by the medical profession out here. Work done by Dr. Wolf. Pregnant women with nausea were given a medication that was said to be a cure for nausea. It was actually a substance that caused vomiting. All of the women experienced entire remission of their nausea and vomiting. When doctors painted warts of their patients with a bright colored inert dye, they were told the warts would be gone when the color wore off. And they were. Researchers found they could open the airways of asthmatics by simply telling them they were inhaling a bronchodilator. In injections of bogus painkillers can activate endorphins in the brain. Clinically depressed patients taking a placebo experience brain activity in the same part of the brain as those taking anti depressants. This to me is, the next couple are amazing. This was done in Baylor College of Medicine. 180 patients with osteoarthritic knees were given either arthroscopic surgery or were given a small cut in the knee. <clears throat> Two years later, those receiving sham surgery felt as much pain relief and sometimes more than those who had had their joint cleaned. They also reported as much improvement in the function. Six months later, the doctors asked the patients if they wanted surgery on the other knee. Six persons in both the surgery and the placebo groups said yes. And this, this again is amazing. Japanese boys who had marked allergic reactions to the lacquer tree, which... Hey, Dr. Dr. Wins, do you have a presentation on that? Have what? Do you have slides for what you're saying? Because I don't see the slides. Oh, I have them up. I'm sorry. I thought you were just reporting, but the slides are not there. Oh. Sorry. I should I wake a little before? Okay, I'm not. Oh, you yeah. have. Oh, sorry. Okay. We, we're on, online now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is the this is the surgery versus placebo cut one. And then we're moving to this one. Um, Japanese boys who had marked allergic reactions to the lacquer tree, which has the same chemical as poison ivy. Um, these boys were blindfolded the left arm was brushed with a branch from the lacquer tree and the right arm with a chestnut branch but the researchers told the boys a fib they told them the opposite was done so that they thought that it was the right arm that was being treated with the lacquer tree within minutes patches of red lumps that you see pictured here appeared with itching and burning on the arm that the boys thought was brushed, the right arm. 
The other arm showed no reaction, the one that actually got the irritating thing. So suggestion and belief, the expectation, <clears throat> was more important than what actually believed. So clearly the brain has a very powerful impact. So Dr. Gupta, Sonia Gupta, you may know him, he's written a book, Chasing Life, um, 2007, he wrote this. And... Um, in, in the book, he explains that this um, placebo effect, why the brain perhaps is working this way. He says there are 10 times more nerves carrying information from the brain than there are sensory nerves feeding into the brain. So the brain takes the sensory information, <laughs> makes sense of it, and if the mind is convinced, then the senses can be ignored signals from the brain could profoundly influence our physiology. The power of a placebo could be explained by this top-down processing by the brain. The brain we know controls GI secretions, hormones, heart rate, immune function, etc. So he suggests it's important to have a positive outlook, be optimistic, and to harness the power of the mind. And People who have a good relationship with their doctor and who follow their instructions and believe that, that things are going right have a more successful outcome than those who have suspicion or disrespect or don't care too much about the recommended medication. So there's, I think I procured this from a National Geographic article. I, I should go back and document it, but where a patient goes for therapy is very important. If you go in another country or in a spa or exotic environment, famous institution like Mayo, and you pay a lot of money, it'll be a lot more effective than if you go to some little clinic in your hometown. If the medication comes from the jungles of Amazon, like the SAE berries or from a little known African country, or it's an exotic mixture from the Arctic or Alpine wilderness or from the Himalayas, like goji berries are popular today. This will enhance the action of the product. If it's expensive and large, it will be more effective than some small pill. The color, the shape, the size, and the taste all influence the response of patients. Multicolored pills are more effective than white ones. A pleasing taste enhances the placebo effect. Newness is appealing to us. And Dr. Oslo, I think, says very, very well, <clears throat> we should use new remedies quickly while they are still efficacious. Something that's been around for a long time, we tend to despise, whereas something new hits the market, the web, oh, everybody's excited. This is the this is the this is the cure all. And Alan White in Ministry of Healing makes the statement the power of the will isn't valued as it should be. Let the will be kept awake and rightly directed, and it'll impart energy to the whole being. Be a wonderful aid in the maintenance of health. Now I say all of that not to undercut everything we've said in the last two and a half lectures about herbs and spices and their phytochemicals and their health promoting properties. But to share with you that <clears throat> there are some herbal usages that people have passed on through the generations and, and people even today <clears throat> swear that such and such works and I've tried it and it doesn't work. And, you know, we hear all these kind of stories. Well, we have to superimpose on all that we've said that there is this placebo effect that is real. <clears throat> okay, so just mentioning a couple of other herbal products. This is a spirea that is the source of aspirin, which is a worldwide analgesic. We mentioned last week, I think it was at the first week, maybe talked about chili peppers and their 
the risk of causing cancer when used in excessive amounts. And of course, it's also part of a, uh, a cream that is used for shingles and other uh, nerve problems because this is known to contain capsaicin, which um, incapacitates nerve pain sensation, but has some benefit. And then there's this Sonatum from New Zealand and Southeast Australia that has saponins from which were made progesterone and estrogen, um, which was the beginning of the entre, uh, con contraceptive pill. So a lot of very useful plants that have been used over the years. This one, Conchona, which is the source of quinine, um, that have been of tremendous benefit to human beings and also have been the beginning point for the pharmaceutical industry to make synthetic analogues. Just two more and we'll finish there. Milk thistle, which um, silymarin compound in there is known to help restore the liver from alcohol damage and from consuming dangerous mushrooms, the Amanita family. And then the Melaleuca uh, tree, the oil from this Australian tree is very useful for um, treating fungal problems such as Mendida and athlete's feet, uh, athlete's foot are the two most common uses. And then this ephedra, which um, was used for making Sudafed, the nasal congestive. So very, very useful. Now, just a word or two about respiratory disorders. Since we've mentioned um, ephedra, Botswana or Botswana is useful for treating asthma um, as multiple acids in the resin. Ephedra also asthmatic condition opens the bronchioles and eucalyptus as expectorant activity, the terpenoid 1,8-cineol um, is active and pycnogenol, which we mentioned last week, is also useful. So they here are four that are useful for asthma or respiratory problems. And then I like to mention um, perhaps what I would call my favorite tea, Roy Bosch from South Africa. You see it growing here um, in the Cape, north of Cape Town. And this is the processed tea that's interesting because it is different from green tea and oolong tea and those teas in that it's free of caffeine and it's low in tannins, which means it doesn't interfere with your eye and metabolism and it's high in flavonoids so it's healthy and it's useful for respiratory ailments so during the winter a cup of warm rooibos tea or red bush tea is a good preventative now moving to diuretics which help the body eliminate sodium and water um, these are rich in flavonoids and or terpenoids and half a dozen of the most important diuretics are here and if you go to the store and buy a herbal diuretic um, many times the the bottle will have all of these or many of these in other words very commonly they mix three or more of these to give uh, a greater potency and the pictures of the products are here, the juniper berries, which grow very commonly in the southwest, goldenrod during the summer, a bearberry or uvaurusi parsley we're familiar with, and stinging nettle, the leaves. The root is for treatment of um, enlarged prostate in men, but the leaves are used as a diuretic. Now, this is an interesting one. We probably know about cranberry juice. Um, it's rich because of the redness. We know it's got anthocyanins in it. 
and um, this inhibits the dangerous bacteria E. coli from attaching to the urinary tract, which is the cause of UTIs. So elderly women who are more prone to this than men, um, who drank 300 mils, about a cup, a little more than a cup of cranberry juice. This is not cranberry cocktail with a lot of sugar and so well, this is straight juice. For six months, we're only one half as likely to develop the urinary tract infections and we're twice as likely to overcome the infection that they had. Um, cranberry and to a lesser degree, blueberry contain these substances. And um, this is the E. coli with the fimbri that kind of like hooks that enable them to attach to the urinary wall. But with the cranberry, the uh, anthocyanin pigments actually do this. They actually stick onto the end of the barb, so that prevents the um, E. coli from colonizing. And once they colonize, of course, they cause serious infection. So cranberry juice has a, a biological, a chemical, a physiological understanding for how it works. People used to think it had to do with pH. And the pH, of course, a little bit acidic and the acidity would, would usually depress bacterial growth. But that's a, that's a very minor factor compared to this factor here. Okay, so now we have um, a look. The screen is locking the thing at the top. I think it says digestive issues. Ginger um, is good for um, women who have morning sickness, also for car sickness, plane sickness, boat sickness. It's an anti-emetic. I remember when we took a boat ride out uh, in Alaska, the captain asked us all if we wanted to take some ginger cookies. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll ask him if he knows why he's offering ginger cookies. And yes, he said the ginger uh, um, prevents my passengers throwing up all over the deck. A peppermint, the British uh, developed research that showed it's useful for irritable bowel syndrome. Chamomile, not so much here, but particularly in Europe, very common tea for um, gastrointestinal spasms, licorice, um, duodenal and peptic ulcers, um, slippery elm is um, the bark, and the elm tree has mucilage, which coats the, line of, the lining of the GI and is very soothing. My dad used to use this very commonly, and he claims it gave him great relief. And then psyllium, we're familiar with metamucil, made from psyllium husks, which has a laxative effect. And then there are some herbs that have effect on the nervous system, the brain, etc. And jimson weed, which you see pictured here at the bottom, is um, grows all around the southwest. And the seeds are have a hallucinogenic effect in the, in the Years past, the hippies used to collect these for their swing. Guarana, which is common in South America. Uh, mate, um, of course, mate tea in Argentina is the drink. These all can have, and, and peyote, which is part of Indian uh, initiation cultures, they also experience different uh, mental changes that take place. Okay, um, let's deal not with the dangerous ones, but with the beneficial ones. St. John's wort is commonly known from many clinical trials. It will be safe and effective for treating mild, moderate depression and anxiety. The active compound here is hypericin, so it's good to look at your package, your bottle, whatever, to see how many milligrams of hypericin is being delivered for a tablet so that you know that it's actually been validated by a lab, some 
this on clinical control or laboratory testing that has been done. Headache relief, the common one that's used is fever few for decreasing the severity and frequency of migraines. Peppermint oil rubbed on the forehead to relieve headaches. Uh, some people try eucalyptus and so forth. Uh-uh, doesn't work. Peppermint oil apparently works for headaches, but not other oils. Okay, here are some uh, mild acting tranquilizers or herbs that have sedative effect. And what I said about the diuretics also applies here that if you go to buy a herbal sedative, they will often um, have three or four of these combined as one stronger um, acting or broader scope acting. So valerian grows in the eastern um, woodlands of the US, hops, lemon balm and passion flower, all of these are known to have mild sedative effects. Valerian is very commonly used um, and has compounds that help with sleep. Um, both the initiation and staying asleep. And then I've got uh, a few pictures here um, on um, essential oils from plants. Lavender is one very commonly known and used for sleep. Um, it has a sedative effect in elderly patients. Um, sleep habits are improved. In another study, the patient slept just as well with lavender as when sleeping pills were used. Quite amazing. Whether there's an added placebo effect, I don't know, but it's certainly cheaper and, and safer to, to, to use the lavender. Lavender enables patients to experience improved sleep and a little less difficulty getting to sleep, less sleep disturbances, and they felt more rested in the morning. Now, if personal testimonies are worth anything, uh, I often sprinkle a bit of olive uh, lavender oil on my pillow when I'm having a few tough nights with sleep, and it works. I fall asleep well. So, again, whether it works or whether it's placebo or both, who cares? I get them asleep, and that's the most important thing. So aromatherapy is a new um, natural therapy which is being practiced and used. These are oils which are distilled from plants, and uh, we know that a pleasant smell helps to relax someone, helps relieve stress. Familiar smells associated with happy memories establish feelings of happiness and reduce stress. Um, putting some vanilla in the workplace um, often makes for a more cheerful atmosphere. Um, essential oils like lavender, rose, vanilla, or orange blossom have the ability to relax a person and reduce stress. Now, the reason these are, are probably working is because um, they, they are inhaled, which is the quickest way to have a drug effect. And these are, the, these, this is connected to the um, limbic system. And the limbic system, of course, is very much involved with memory and emotion. And so the connection of a nice smell with a pleasant situation can reactivate that at a later time. In a similar way, a bad smell with a bad experience can have the opposite effect. Neroli oil has a calming and relaxing scent. It can help alleviate anxiety and heart palpitations, relief insomnia, and even help prevent or stress-related depression. Don't we need that now? The Surgeon General said that 50% of high school students are suffering from depression. 
Okay, it's another study, 122 patients in ICU, and they were massaged with lavender. They had less anxiety. Women in labor had less anxiety, less pain, and better contractions when they were exposed with one of these aromatic oils. Chronic pain may produce anxiety, depression, irritability, immobility, and insomnia. Numerous studies have found that essential oils applied on the outside have helped cancer patients to better cope with their pain, they have less anxiety and strain. Now, I want to emphasize apply topically. Massaging, of course, causes dilation of the blood vessels, enables the oils to be um, absorbed more easily, but this is not orally. Some of these oils are toxic, and so one shouldn't. Uh, you can get away with aloe vera, but many of these uh, essential oils that are used in a, a, a aromatherapy should not be used orally. Post-operative patients who underwent breast biopsy thought pain relief when 2% lavender oil and patients with rheumatoid arthritis had less pain and slept better when they had massage with lavender. Some of the components of the essential oils have analgesic properties or may affect neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Now, this, this gives you the, the uh, source of most of what I gave you there that didn't have a reference. It's taken from Mosby's um, popular book on complementary and alternate medicine, a research-based approach. And um, chapter 14 is devoted totally to aromatherapy and it's got scientific peer-reviewed papers. So I didn't give you anything that hasn't been documented. There are other things um, could go this way or not. I see we call them. I haven't given you any of that. It's always class A or class B um, information that I've given you. Okay, so um, I've pretty much, I think there's this, I see the time has run out, so we probably should not linger too much more. Uh, Norsey's controlled also. Just two pictures on uh, men and women's problems, and then we can call it quits. I think it's um, five to 12, five to one. But uh, enlarged prostate is a common problem in elderly men, BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy. And there are some natural products that are available. Pumpkin seeds are full of steroids, which um, are beneficial and helpful. Also, the berries are shown here from the southeast, uh, Georgia and Florida, of the saw palmetto palm. Um, these berries that when they ripen, they you can see some of the ripe ones there, they turn more purply. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the root of stinging nettle, these are all commonly available. The African prune tree, the bark also has activity, but that's not so commonly available in the United States, but these other three are commonly available and they all tend to maintain the prostate from getting any bigger or may in some cases cause slight reduction. And then women with um, various issues of excessive um, menstrual bleeding or pain or bloating during their monthly cycle, there are various um, herbs that have been used that are pictured here, black cohosh, and uh, the berries of the chase tree, red clover, which is extremely popular in Australia, and then evening primrose oil, which is also very popular. All four of these have been used by women during their monthly cycle for various ailments and discomfort. And um, they 
they work evening primrose oil my my sister used to use and she would testify it gave her relief so personal testimonies don't probably amount much in science but I tell people that if it works and it doesn't cost much, why not go for it uh, <clears throat> to relieve pain and anxiety, discomfort. That's what life should be all about, removing those uncomfortable things. So as a conclusion to the three lectures we've given, we'll just make this one simple statement that the uh, discriminate use of herbs and spices or their extracts and have real therapeutic value. But read the label, follow the instructions, do not take more than what they suggest. Um, the old idea that some pesticide helps with the weed so more will, will kill it better, you know, it doesn't work. And the same thing with these herbal products. You don't want to endanger yourself because the herbs are as we mentioned in the first lecture are, are they are like drugs they're mild acting natural drugs and so you can you can abuse them misuse them and you can get negative effects so they should be used judiciously carefully and if there are any um, side effects that are not good or even side effects that you are not expecting, then you should not continue with it. If nothing's happening, maybe change the brand. But it's always good, as we've mentioned, keep in contact with your healthcare practitioner. Um, we should advise all our clients and friends and relatives to do that, not be doing this in the dark, because they do, they can accentuate or they can negate a regular blood pressure or, or blood thinning medication. And so, yeah, doctors and nurses and healthcare and nurse practitioners, PAs, whatever, they all need to know what we are doing, what we are taking, so that if we go for surgery, something bad doesn't happen. So, okay, I've given my final sermon there. Hope you've gain some information we did have a few pictures on charcoal but we'll do that next year maybe thank you thank you thank you dr dr craig and then uh, well we can uh, we can have a few minutes for questions if someone has any i will ask the first question is that uh, I heard that if we see a label there in a in a bottle of a, of an herbal that has USP, can we trust more than if it does not have this USP? Probably, but I don't know that it's um, well. That stands for U U.S. Pharmacopeia, and I. Um, to be quite honest, I have to tell you the truth. I'm not sure. Maybe um, somebody on the line could help us. What that actually means in terms of regulating or author authorizing the uh, authenticity of, of what one is taking. Uh, it usually means, I thought, something to do with the formulary, but um, I see some other professors there. They may be able to help me. But um, what do you do? You have any recommendations in terms of uh, brands? So how we can be sure? Because I am from Brazil, and one time they have this uh, turtle oil that they were selling. It was quite expensive. And then one laboratory got this and, and checked, and it was just uh, soy oil. Yeah, that's... oil on that. So, how can we be sure that we have those things uh, and <laughs> we can trust what we are getting? I wish I had an answer because I'm the example you gave. I'm also thinking about um, avocado oil, which sells um, 
quite a bit more expensively than some other oils. And um, some people at UC Davis have tested and found that it is, like you mentioned, heavily uh, contaminated with soy oil, which is so much cheaper. And uh, the, it doesn't smell differently, doesn't look differently, doesn't taste differently. Um, and, you know, the same, like I mentioned with echinacea, there there is a common plan, and the, the name just eludes me right now, but it's a white powder that looks and smells and tastes just like echinacea, and they they can add 50% of it, and it costs nothing, this common weed that they add to it, and yet people pay for what they think is echinacea. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a, a perpetual a problem. Way. And as long, as long as Congress refuses to allow FDA to regulate these products, this sort of stuff will continue to go on. Um, but your, your original question was what are the brands? And um, I, I know of some brands. I, I probably should send you a list by email. Okay. I'll try to spout them out now, but there are certain ones. I think he's gone. I think he just let or he got booted out or something. I don't know what happened. Yeah, his I don't see him anymore. See, yeah, maybe he touched something. Let's see if he's gonna come back. But I've anyways, heard, I've heard did of you kick like him out? Nature's way or no, nature's path for brands. Nature's path. I think it's nature's path or nature's way, something like that. Uh. But I I look for the USP. There's another there's another one too. There's yeah. another uh, regulatory uh, group. But when you see that label, when you see that mark on the label, it means that they have looked at it and analyzed to make sure that the um, ingredient is what it says it is on the label and in the amount it's supposed to be. Yeah, it has standards and regulations. It doesn't automatically sit, mean that that herbal product will do what it's marketed to do so the health effect may not be what it's marketing but the ingredient or you know the what it contains is you're pretty high you're pretty high to be sure it's pretty sure that it will be what it says or what it's marketing it's just the health effect you might not be 100 percent clear on yeah well well but it does not mean that um like I, I I bought something in the um, in Sprouts and they don't have as USP, but they are pretty. I'm pretty sure what they have was 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 because the elderberry that I bought there was smelling like that was capsules and you don't have any doubt that they have elderberry there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Comparing to I had the same question. Not, yeah. Go ahead, but uh, the guys oh, no. are here. <laughs> I know. I was just going to say, I had the same question. What brand and uh, how do you know it's pure? Like um, I have bought oregano oil for upper respiratory uh, conditions. And even that is mixed with other oils. So it's sometimes it's hard to find just one type of oil. No, Dr. Winston a... is back. He's back. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened, but I lost total power on my computer and screen and everything. <laughs> Maybe it was a Russian missile. <laughs> well, anyways, um, you you were we, you were talking about um, the brands uh, that you are going to uh, send to email, huh? by yeah. email. Yeah, I, I, I will check it out and email you and you can share it with people if they're interested. Okay. I have a question. Dr. Go Craig, ahead. this is Lisbeth Fernandez. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I was wondering uh, how familiar you are with oregano oil and upper respiratory uh, conditions and how it can heal. Um, yeah, I, I'm not as well versed about oregano oil as I'd like to be, but um, there, you know, its relative time is useful for throat. Those mint, that mint family do have um, 
a therapeutic value with upper respiratory and upper GI, the upper system. So there is some credibility that oregano oil can be effective. I just, I'm just cautious about the, the degree of value. If, if one has a, a, a serious, a very serious respiratory issue, then these milder herbs may not work quickly enough and strongly enough to be able to bring relief that you're looking for. But on the other hand, I would say that for mild cases, they are valuable, helpful, useful. Again, Thank you. Um, again, if you're interested, I can do a little research on it and get back to you if I find anything different. Oh, I would love I can, that. Thank I you can so send much. It, I can send it to Dr. DeSantos and he can, yeah, he can further it along to you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, we will keep in touch uh, yeah. with, with uh, you, Dr. I, Dr. Craig, and oh, then we... I, I have hear. something. Um, okay, I just, ahead, I just, uh, I just quickly looked online and found a uh, list of best, uh, most recommended herbal supplement brands as recommended by pharmacists. So maybe that could be useful. And uh, the top two were Nature Made and Nature's Bounty. I think I've been getting the Nature Made ones. Sounds anyway, good. I'll, I'll just throw that out there for your consideration. <laughs> That sounds good to me. Those are two good ones. Na nature's bounty and nature's need. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Craig, and uh, and we believe that is very informative, and, and then it's it's something that we really need, and we will keep in touch. Maybe in the future we can have other sessions. Uh, uh, and then and, 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 uh, amplify these issues a little more. Oh, Thank you very much. All the best to all of you. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you. And thank you for the email about Elderberry. Okay. You're welcome.